Okay, today is the last, hopefully, of the videos for this semester. Um, you'll have a short quiz afterwards, about five questions. Uh, we're going to be dealing with um, uh, imperfect competition. Um, here we're going to look at what we call monopolistic competition and oligopoly. And these two market structures are in between perfect competition and monopoly. Um, they're not as wonderful and sweet as perfect competition, and they're not as big, bad, and ugly as monopoly, but they are still inefficient. Okay. Imperfect competition, these are market structures in between the extremes of perfect competition and monopoly. The first one we're going to look at is monopolistic competition. Here, just like perfect competition, you have many small sellers. But, and here's the difference, they sell a differentiated product. Under perfect competition, they sold a homogeneous product. People deal, deal, uh, thought of it as the same. Here, these products are basically the same, but they're differentiated. Think of laundry soap, for example. Okay, laundry soaps basically do the same thing. They wash your clothes. Uh, some brands differentiate their products a little bit with the smell, say like a Tide or a Gain, or they differentiate it by putting, um, you know, uh, oh, my brain just went on me, uh, by putting in, um, say, uh, all fabric bleach or something like that. But they all basically do the same thing. But each product is slightly differentiated. And you have easy entry and exit. Not very easy, but easy. Okay, how many is many sellers? The many sellers condition is met when each firm is so small relative to the total market that its pricing decisions have a negligible effect on the market price. Product differentiation, the process of creating real or apparent differences between goods and services. This product's differentiation could be done with something as simple as packaging. Okay, you might spend money packaging the product. Um, real quick, just a little story. When I, my wife and I had our first child, um, she had, um, oh, she, she, colic. And my wife said, go down to the store and buy, um, the medication for it. And she said, buy the brand name stuff. Don't buy the store brand because she knows I'm cheap. So I went to the pharmacy and I couldn't find it. And I asked the pharmacist and he came out and showed it to me. He said, here's the product you're looking for right there. But there's one right next to it. That's our brand. It's just as good. And I said, no, my wife said she'd kill me if I, if I buy the, the store brand. And he told me, he said, look, don't tell anybody. But the same company that makes the brand name makes ours. The only difference is the packaging. And they advertise, and that drives their costs up. So uh, that was an example of product differentiation. Very easy entry, or excuse me, easy entry and exit means there are low barriers to entry and exit. It's not quite as easy as, as perfect competition, but it's a lot easier than a monopolistic market. And then the barriers to entry are that under monopolistic competition, firms can differentiate themselves from their competitors in ways other than price. And that's through non-price competition. A firm competes using advertising, packaging, product development, better service, rather than lower prices. Okay. Um, we say that a monopolistic competitive firm because of product differentiation is a price maker. All that means is they face a downward sloping demand curve. Now for a monopolistically competitive firm, the demand curve that the firm faces is very flat. They do not have a large amount of pricing power. Okay. So you can see it's less elastic, it's steeper than for a perfectly competitive firm. They had a horizontal curve, but it's very flat relative to 
the demand curve for a monopolist. Here's some examples of perfectly competitive firms. Uh, you wouldn't know anything about this last one. That's old video rental stores. They used to have video rental stores. But they all rented the same video. Each one differentiated themselves a little bit. Blockbuster, which say, hey, we get all the new releases first. Another store, you know, might say, hey, we've got more movies, whatever. Grocery stores, every grocery store has pretty much the same stuff in them. Uh, if you were to go grocery shopping around here, Kroger, I mean, we have Kroger, um, Win Dixie and Publix, they differentiate themselves with service, and Publix is a lot nicer and pretty inside. And uh, maybe like Aldi says, "Hey, we don't <clears throat> we don't have service at all. You know, we have um, low prices." Now, one thing that is used in perfect competition that we didn't talk about yet is advertising. Now, your book says advertising is somewhat effective in the short run, but less effective in the long run. Okay. And advertising causes increases in the long run average cost curve for these firms. You can see here, here's the long run average cost curve without advertising, and we have to bump it up some for advertising. As with all profit maximizing firms, a firm decides what price to charge and how much output to produce by operating up to the point where marginal revenue, MR, equals marginal cost. You should memorize that equation. Okay. Now here, this firm faces a downward sloping demand curve just like a monopolist. Okay. For perfect competition, it really should be drawn more, more of a flatter one, but that's all relative. Because it is a downward sloping demand curve, we have a downward sloping marginal revenue. Marginal revenue is always less than demand or price. Here we have that slanted J, the marginal cost curve in green, where the orange marginal revenue curve crosses the green marginal cost curve. That determines where this firm will operate. You find where that point, where those two, two uh, curves cross, Go straight down, that says how much output they'll produce. Take that output, trace it up all the way to the demand curve, and that's the price that will be charged on the market, in this case $20. So this firm will sell its output at $20 and sell four units. <clears throat> Total revenue is price times the quantity sold. So $20 times four units is the area of this box here drawn on the outside that's total revenue we can figure out total cost by tracing quantity produced up to the average total cost curve and going straight across so this firm looks like it's paying on average twelve dollars and fifty cents per unit of output twelve dollars and fifty cents times the four units of unit of output produced is average, excuse me, is total cost. That's the area of this smaller rectangle here. So four times 1250 is $50. So this firm sells $80 worth of output and it pays $50 to produce and sell that output. The difference, in this case, $30, would be its total profit. So you can calculate total revenue, price times quantity, and I showed you how to get that, that's 80. Trace the quantity up to the average total cost curve, go straight across, that's 1250. So this firm sells, the, the units of output this firm sells, they, they cost 1250 on average, they produce 12, four units, 1250 times four is $50, we could color this in r red maybe for cost. And then the difference between the two is your total profit. We could also calculate our average variable, total variable cost if we want by tracing this line up to average variable cost going across. It looks like $9. So 36 of those $50 are spent in variable cost. Subtract 30, what do we say, 36 from 50 
and that would tell us that $14 of these costs are fixed. Now, all firms in this market will produce, uh, excuse me, will produce output at a normal profit in the long run, and that's because of easy entry and exit. So that's the same as we had before with the perfectly competitive firm. These firms cannot make an economic profit in the long run because of the easy entry and exit. Firms will enter the industry and the demand curve for each firm will shift to the left and the market price declines and economic profits are erased. So if a firm, if firms are making a positive economic profit in this industry, that will attract other firms to enter into the industry. That will cause market demand to decrease and the price of their output to decrease until all firms in the long run will be producing output and making a normal economic profit. When losses are made, the opposite ha happens. Firms in that industry that are losing money will leave it and shift to other industries. That will cause the demand curve to increase for each firm, boosting its market price, and profitability will be restored. So in the long run, all firms will make a zero economic profit. They can make an economic profit or suffer an economic loss in the short run, but in the long run, that all gets worked out and they make a normal economic profit, which is a zero economic profit. Okay, so this is what it looks like for a monopolistically competitive firm in the long run. The demand curve becomes tangent to the long run average cost curve. It only touches it at one point. At that point, price is equal to the long run average cost. So we're selling units at $20 a piece, but we're also paying $20 in costs to produce them. So this firm is making a zero economic profit. If this were a perfectly competitive market, they'd have a horizontal demand curve. And just by the nature of the long run average cost curve, that would intersect out here where this curve bottoms out. In that case, under perfect competition, more output would be produced. The good or the service would sell at a lower price and be produced at a lower per unit cost. Here's our perfectly competitive firm in the long run. So you can see more output will be produced under the perfectly competitive firm. They'll produce output at a lower per unit cost. And this firm will be efficient. The other firm in the neoclassical view is not efficient because if they operate, say, out here, or excuse me, up here, my fault, okay, marginal cost is lower. So the price is not equal to the marginal cost. And that is not an efficient equilibrium that produces uh, an equilibrium where there are mutually beneficial exchanges that could be made and in the neoclassical view would be made under perfect competition. But under monopolistic competition, they don't get made, and that's because the firm faces a downward sloping demand curve. And these are the things we just talked about. The next market we're going to look at is a oligopolistic market. An oligopoly has few sellers. So this makes an oligopoly different from all the other markets we looked at in terms of number of sellers. Under oligopoly, you have few. Under monopoly, you have one. Under perfect competition and monopolistic competition, you have many. 
But don't ask me how many few is, we don't know. In an oligopolistic market, producers sell a differentiated product, so it's similar to monopolistic competition. Here, you might think of an oil company. They all sell oil, but each one of them puts a little bit different additive in the oil. Okay, so Tecron is in Texaco, right? Um, Shell has their own, etc. And this market, it's difficult to enter. So that also makes it different. It's not easy, like monopolistic competition. It's not very easy, like perfect competition. But it's not impossible, like monopoly. Okay, few sellers when the firms are so large relative to their total market that they can affect the market price and there's more than one. These guys also engage in non-price uh, competition because of a differentiated product. So they compete in ways other than price and we talked about the gas stations. Okay, economies of scale can be a significant barrier to entry. It takes a lot of capital to build an oil company. Okay. And the distinguishing feature of oligopoly, something as a result of those assumptions in the model that make it different from all the others, is something called mutual interdependence. Mutual interdependence is a condition in which an action by one firm may cause a reaction from other firms. In all these other cases, if the firm did something, that had no or little effect on the other firms in the market, so they don't react to it. Or in the case of a monopoly, there isn't another firm in the market to react. So here, with mutual interdependence, the actions of one firm cause a reaction by other firms. Okay. And this mutual interdependence has the effect in this market of giving us what they call a kinked demand curve. Okay, And I'm going to show you a kinked demand curve first. You can see here, this would be the price that the good is selling for on the market, say $250. Now firms have a problem in the, if you're an oligopoly. If you raise your price your competitors will not follow you. They'll let you go off by yourself. So if you were to increase your price, that would cause the demand curve above the current price to be very steep. In other words, a small increase in the price of the good will have a large increase on the quantity demanded. If you'll remember, the price elasticity of demand is equal to the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by a percentage change in price. The percentage change in quantity demanded will be larger than the percentage change in price. So the price elasticity of demand will be greater than one, which means that demand is elastic. Elastic demand, if you raise your price, total revenues will go down. So you might charge a higher price, but you'll sell so many fewer units that your total revenue goes down. <clears throat> now, the curve is very steep at any price below the current price of 250. In this case, if you lower your price, your competitors will follow you. So here, a large change in price, say dropping the price, has a very small effect on the quantity demanded because everyone else follows you. Candy bars are a good example of a, of a uh, market that has a kink demand curve. Okay, You go to a candy bar, candy store, or go to, excuse me, go to a gas station, there's all these different types of candy available for you. If one firm were to raise their price, there's a bunch of other candy bars there just like it. 
with chocolate, chocolate and the same stuff, I always use a Butterfinger, right? So if Butterfinger were to raise their prices, say charge $2 for a candy bar, a Clark bar and a hundred grand bar, other candy bars that are just like it, would keep their price at a dollar twenty-nine. That would cause a problem for Butterfinger. If they're trying to make higher profits by raising their prices, the other candy makers don't follow, then you'd have a two dollar Butterfinger sitting next to a dollar twenty-nine Clark bar. And people would not buy the Butterfinger. So a huge change in quantity demand would arise. On the other hand, if one candy maker drops their prices, all the others have to follow. Okay, how do oligopolists determine price? Your book says they play the game, follow the leader, that economists call price leadership. Price leadership is a pricing strategy in which a dominant firm sets the price for an industry and the other firms follow suit. In the gasoline and oil business, Exxon is considered a price leader. So everyone will keep their prices the same as Exxon, roughly, until Exxon changes their price. If Exxon raises their price, everyone will raise their price. If Exxon drops their price, everyone will, will drop their price. And that's called price leadership or tit for tat. Now, a way to get around all of this is to form what is called a cartel. A cartel is a group of firms formally agreeing to control the price and output of a part of a, of a, a product. Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, is sort of a cartel. The International Telephone Cartel. International Airline Cartel. Okay. Now, these firms will all get together, even though there's a few suppliers of the good or service, they'll get together and they'll all act like a monopolist. And they will all act in a way that sets price to the point where total profits are maximized for the firm. And they'll try and operate like a monopoly. The problem with the cartel is they never last. And one of the reasons is because of member firms cheating. In the OPEC cartel, the big cheater is Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> they have huge oil fields where the oil is very easy to get to. There are some oil fields in Saudi Arabia where they can pull the oil up out of the ground for a dollar or two in cost per barrel. So if OPEC sets the price at $80 a barrel and they give Saudi Arabia a quota, the Saudis can pull oil up out of the ground at $2 a barrel and sell it for $80 a barrel or close to 80 if they cheat on the cartel. That's a big, huge pile of money that is usually facing the lowest cost producer and that will induce them to cheat. A simple question, are firms or governments, in this case in the business, of making friends or money? And of course the answer is money, and if a firm can make money by cheating on a cartel agreement, they will. And the Saudis always are the cheaters on OPEC. Okay. So we'll ignore this graph. The final thing we're going to look at is game theory. And this is a model of the strategic moves and counter moves of rivals. Okay. So there are two pricing strategies for um, oligopolies. Tit for tat and price leadership. Tit for tat, under this approach, a player will do whatever the other player did the last time. So if we're in the candy industry, and Clark Bar raises their price. Butterfinger, 100 Grand Bar, etc. those companies might hold the price of their cop their their candy constant for a quarter. Then next quarter, they'll raise their price up to whatever Clark Bar did. 
And then Clark Barr will do something different. Price leadership, we've talked a bit about. That's where one company follows the price that the leader sets. Our final conclusion here is companies communicate and decide what prices to charge uh, cons consumers. I'm sorry, I said final conclusion. This is formal collusion. Now here, that would be in the form usually of a cartel, okay, where the companies communicate with each other and they decide what price to charge customers and they all set the same price. Okay, and that is against the law. Informal collusion arises when companies find alternative ways to agree on a price without any tacit communication. Formal collusion is purely illegal in this country. If you are a business and you get caught colluding with your with your uh, competitors, you're going to go to jail. Your company's going to get large fines and or may be broken up. Informal collusion is sort of illegal, but it's much harder to prove. Okay. Now here, as long as the benefits exceed the cost, cheating can threaten formal and informal agreements among oligopolists, excuse me, oligopolists to maximize joint profits. Okay. Under oligopoly, the price charged for the product will be higher than under perfect competition and less than under monopoly. More money is spent on forms of non-price competition. So these outputs will be produced at higher cost than would be produced under perfect competition. And that's the end. Have a great day. Short quiz and you're done. Thank you. Goodbye.